Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Data Fabric Connecting the Dots Between Structured and Unstructured Data, brought to you by the SNEA Cloud Storage Technology Initiative. This is Michael Horde, your host and facilitator for today's discussion. I work for Intel, and I serve as chair for the SNEA Cloud Storage Technology Initiative. Today's conversation is with Joe Dane, who serves as a senior technical staff member and master in innovator, working with IBM Storage Infrastructure and CTO Office. Hello, J uh, Joe, how are you? Hi, Michael, good, thank you for having me. Awesome, great. Let's see, before we get started, I want to mention the SNEA that SNEA is a group of about 200 industry leading organizations comprising of about 2,500 active contributing members and 50,000 participating IT end users and storage experts worldwide. As one of the organizations within SNEA, the, CTSI, the CSTI is dedicated to education and promotion of cloud storage technologies like AI at the edge, storage security and management, as well as driving understanding and collaboration among other industry associations. Before we get started, let's take a quick look at the SNEA legal notice. This provides SNEA's copyright notice regarding use of the material. There are no warranties expressed or implied. So if you want to reference this material, please do so at your own risk. You can download a copy of this presentation using the interface for this live webinar. The interface also allows you to submit questions during the talk and rate this presentation at the conclusion. We really appreciate your questions and feedback. There we go. For today's discussion, we will learn about some of the data management challenges around multiple hybrid cloud deployments, data framework con concepts to unify governance and privacy, and an example customer application involving regulatory compliance requirements. Please submit uh, questions at any time during this presentation. If we're not able to cover all the questions during the session, we will answer your questions in a Q&A blog, which will be posted after this webinar. So let's get started. Joe, please take it away. Great, thank you, Michael. To first set the context, we'll talk about the customer challenges in this realm. Customers typically have data spread across multiple different silos, and these silos may be on-prem or in the cloud. For example, a customer may have one or more databases such as DB2 running in an IBM cloud. They may have different applications such as Salesforce running in Amazon. They may also have on-prem applications and data such as a MySQL database or an NFS export or an S3 object store. And in this type of a context, uh, end users need to have access to the data to do things such as build new applications, do analytics projects or AI projects. <clears throat> and in this context, the first challenge is being able to understand what data you have. And in order to do that, that can impact the time to be able to access the data and slow down uh, projects associated with building such analytics and AI applications. And when you need to get access to this data, uh, there's also usually a step of data integration where you need to take some of the data from one data source and data from a different data source and combine it in a new way so that you can make meaningful use of that data for whatever your end goal is. But the most important and, and the focus of this talk is when I have all this data that is spread across multiple different clouds, uh, multiple different applications and data sources, how do I understand what data I have? How can I classify that data? How can I comply with various standards and enforce data governance and also data security so that I can ensure that only the right people have access to the right data and that I can prove that I'm protecting and managing my data across this hybrid cloud landscape in an appropriate manner. <clears throat> and to take this a little bit further, 
there are multiple different data types that are encountered in such environments. So for example, a customer may have multiple different types of structured databases, such as DB2, MySQL, or document stores such as MongoDB. And then customers also typically have uh, sometimes referred to semi-structured data, such as uh, JSON or Parquet. Uh, these, these representations of data may be stored in Hive tables, uh, ORC and, and Abro are also other popular data formats that we see. And then it, along with that, we also have unstructured documents, such as PDF documents, logs, uh, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, et cetera. And then last but not least, customers often typically have uh, other types of unstructured data, such as videos, uh, images, audio, and things of the like. And so when we have all of this data combined with the spread of the data in these different locations, uh, it becomes challenging to be able to manage the state and understand what data you have and govern it in a secure and compliant manner. Yeah, there's a question from the audience. Um, just uh, if you could provide some specific challenges that, that have been encountered when you're building this uh, with regard to the data. Sure. Um, so the, the, one of the challenges with the data is in particular the unstructured data side. So from a structured data point of view, uh, there's typically, I would say, you know, thousands to hundreds of thousands of tables that need to be um, curated and monitored and governed. Whereas with unstructured data, uh, we typically encounter billions of documents uh, that is spread across multiple locations. And this causes a challenge of different scale uh, in that you have to be able to track all of this unstructured data <clears throat> and then understand what it is. And also the variety of that data makes it challenging to understand and go beyond here is a file, but I also need to know what is in this file so that I can classify it and protect it accordingly. And being able to do that at scale, along with being able to combine that with structured data to provide an end to end view uh, is is a challenging problem that the data fabric that we'll talk about is aimed to address. Great, thank you. And so on that point, uh, this introduces a data fabric architecture. And one of the key points <clears throat> of a data fabric architecture is that you leave the data in place. So even though you may have data that's sitting in multiple different clouds and, and on premise, you can leave that data in place and then discover what data you have and the idea behind this data fabric is that we can collect metadata about all of this data and put this abstraction layer on top of these data sources so that now through the abstraction layer we can understand what data we have by being able to leverage techniques such as uh, ai and content inspection to be able to understand what data is out there and then we can have this standard way of accessing data through this data fabric, which allows us to, uh, one, in, uh, enable efficient self-service data access. So uh, being able to come into the data fabric and search for data that you're looking for because we have the, the location of the data and the context of what the data is about. But also uh, very important is the ability to govern and secure that data and being able to classify that data. And so, being able to understand that perhaps you have a DB2 table sitting in IBM Cloud that contains customer information in it. Now you can classify that and track that. And by being able to track that, you can set data governance and security policies that indicate only certain users should have access to the data. This data containing personal information should not be uh, put in, enabled to be seen by people uh, in the public, et cetera. And it all funnels through this data fabric. So now, as users come into the system and they need to get access to the data to do an AI or analytics project, they have this self-service uh, governed manner to be able to access this data wherever that data may reside. And it really abstracts the location of that data from the end users. <clears throat> now to take this a step further, as mentioned before, um, it, being able to combine these different data types and data silos into one view is a challenging problem. And so we introduced the concept of uh, unified data fabric. And what unified data fabric entails is being able to 
uh, have a unified view of your structured and unstructured data all in one place. And being able to have all in one place a view of all of your data uh, allows you to then have what's what we refer to as unified data governance. So by unified data governance, typically customers will have a set of business terms that they want to apply across their data. For example, I may want to say that this data belongs to project XYZ or department ABC, or I want to say that this data contains proprietary company information or customer information. And you have this common set of business terms that are applied across your data for both structured and unstructured data. <clears throat> and now once you're able to do that, uh, you can use those, those unified governance terms to be able to enforce data privacy. And data privacy entails being able to say, for example, uh, I may have a table that has a social security number in it, and I may have some, um, some file data sitting in a file system or, or some objects that also have a social security number in it. Being able to then have a data privacy policy that restricts access to this information uh, and only the appropriate users can access it based on how the data governance terms and business terms have been applied across this environment. And by doing so, this ensures a level of trust, protection, security, and compliance across this hybrid cloud landscape. So the next part takes a closer look at um, how do we actually go from just what data do we have to what is the data about? And breaking this apart into different uh, problem sets, we can look at structured data first. And typically in structured data, since there are, there's a well-defined schema, the process is to analyze the data in the columns and to be able to label these columns. So in this example here, we can see we have in column one, we have something that looks like a name. Column two looks like something like a phone number. Column three looks like an email address. And column four um, is not quite clear at the moment what that, can, that column contains. But through a process of profiling the data as a part of the data fabric, <clears throat> it can make uh, predictions about the content of the different columns for the different tables that are managed in the data fabric. So in this case, there is the concept of a name that it has a high probability of being associated with column one. So column two could be either a social security number or something different. So we assign it to a social security number. Column three looks like an email address. And then column four, with a data fabric and data governance architecture, there are uh, typically default data governance terms that are applied in terms of profiling, things like names, uh, locations, um, social security numbers, credit card numbers, et cetera. But you can also customize the data governance and business terms that you want to be able to look for. So in this case, you can create a custom business term that looks for department ID. So that uh, now if I have, if I encounter a string or a term that looks like this uh, department ID, I can automatically label that column across my data. Uh, another example of this is uh, looking at part numbers. So perhaps I have some part numbers from a, a manufacturer that I want to look for and then label it accordingly. And so there's really a wide variety of customization that you can do in terms of your business glossary that you want to apply across your data in the data fabric in order to um, understand what your data is about and how to better govern it. Now, looking at the unstructured data side, this is a, a little bit more involved because of the variety of data types and the, and the lack of structure, such as a schema, is often encountered in these types of data. So when being able to incorporate unstructured data into a data fabric architecture, the first step is typically looking at what's referred to as the technical metadata. The technical metadata encapsulates things like what is the name of the file? What is the size of the file? When was it created? Um, what, what file store does it or export does it reside in? 
for object storage, it can be in the name of the bucket where the object resides, the, the name of the object itself, the size, et cetera. And <clears throat> this technical metadata is collected for all of the data sources in your environment. And now once we do this, this allows you to have a view of all of the unstructured data in your environment uh, independent of the data silo where it is located. <clears throat> And that's great, but now that we know where the data is, we need to know what the data is about. So there are a variety of techniques to enrich our knowledge about the uh, unstructured data. One method that uh, is a precursor to looking at the content itself is to inspect the, the, the path of the data. So for example, if I have a file system that has a well-defined path layout, uh, typically you can find interesting information in that path layout and extract that and be able to apply that uh, as additional enrichments on the data. So for example, <clears throat> a customer may have a file system layout where the first subdirectory is a department, the next subdirectory is a project. And by being able to parse that file path, you can extract meaning of that data and associate um, the department and project of each and every file to go just beyond the technical metadata, but bring business context and meaning to that unstructured data. <clears throat> Another way to do this is header extraction. So um, most file formats today have well-defined header layouts. Uh, one example is a EXIF file format for images where there's a metadata embedded in each image. And by being able to open that image and extract the headers from that, uh, you can gain additional insight about what that data is about. Uh, in the medical field, for example, there are DICOM images that have DICOM headers that have information such as uh, patient name, uh, ID, uh, date of birth, et cetera. And you can extract that information as well so that you can understand uh, not only do I have a set of images that are associated with the medical industry, but I have what, what are in those images. So I can start building more and more knowledge about the data that I have uh, across my billions of files in my environment. <clears throat> and then there are also various uh, AI techniques that are applied to be able to extract additional meaning from the data. One concept is uh, natural language processing, which is typically performed on unstructured text. So by doing natural uh, language processing, one popular method is named entity recognition, for example. So named entity recognition uh, will be able to help you identify people, locations, organizations, et cetera. Um, there's sentiment analysis, um, other types of, of AI that you can apply to unstructured text. And by doing so, this gives you a better view of the type of unstructured data that you have. So you can understand if I have a pile of uh, a million PDF documents and I, I know that they're sitting in a particular object storage bucket, but I don't know what's in them, <clears throat> I can run a profiling job using some type of uh, AI inferencing on them, such as natural language processing to gain more insight about that data. And in this case, in all of these cases here, the additional insight that is gleaned from the unstructured data is captured as additional metadata or labels. And these labels are very lightweight. Uh, they're easily indexable in the, the catalog that you build for the Unified Data Fabric database. So for example, if I have a PDF document that is five pages long, but I have a small list of labels that I extract from those PDF documents uh, about you know, what customer names are in those PDF documents, for example, I can index just those labels into my data catalog and I can also associate that with the technical metadata. So <clears throat> what I'm doing is connecting the dots. And so I have here is the name of an object and I have here is what's inside this object. And now I can use that information to enable that self-service searching for the data for the end users also use that to help with the, the data governance to be able to apply data privacy rules because now I know that this PDF document has customer information in it. And another AI technique that's used on unstructured data
to help bring additional context to the data that's managed in a data fabric is the things like computer vision. And in this case, uh, what's shown here is the simple concept of um, bounding box object detection. So by being, and the idea is that you have an AI inference model that you can send images to, it will predict what it sees in that image, and then it will tell you the labels that it found. Um, and you can see here the detection box of where in that image it's located, along with the probability or accuracy or confidence of what it's predicting. And again, this constitutes additional uh, metadata that we can then extract and then add to our index of our data catalogs that we're building. So we're constantly building a view of what data we have, but what is also in that data and leveraging these insights from AI, header extraction, um, metadata path parsing, et cetera, to be able to enrich our knowledge about our data to enable more insights, uh, better governance, better security, and better self-service data access. So once we're able to do that, <clears throat> the next part of this is data privacy enforcement. And the idea behind data privacy enforcement is now that we have this data fabric portal that end users come into to be able to access the data uh, in the data silos, regardless of where those data silos exist, we have a layer that we can enforce who can see what. And so typically there's a policy engine that creates rules to, to do just that. And the rules, for example, you can say, I have, uh, if a user group that has public access and I find a data class that has a specific part number that is internal to my company, I want to restrict access to that. And so, for example, if I have, uh, and what I've drawn up here is a vendor inventory table, where in this inventory table, I have part numbers along with the stock of, uh, of these particular part numbers for my organization. And so as part of what we talked about before, being able to profile the data, first starting on the structured side, the structured data profiling is going to identify that this table contains a part number. And then I can use other techniques such as um, natural language processing or simple regular expression pattern matching to look at unstructured data to be able to identify that, okay, I have some design documents that also have this part number in them, so I need to label them accordingly. And then I also have in this example other docu unstructured documents such as product data sheets. So let's say that I'm, I'm providing an end product to the user and I have a marketing data sheet that I'm storing and I want the public to be able to see, but these users don't need to be able to see the design documents associated with that product and how it's being designed and built. They don't need to see the inventory and the, the vendors that we're using to build this particular product. So we restrict the access to these vendor inventory tables and design documents by virtue of this policy engine and which dials back into the ability to understand what data you have. And then the end result here is that when users access the data through the portal, the data, uh, the data fabric portal, the rule is automatically enforced and the public access user group only sees the product data sheets. So these data privacy rules are completely customizable and you can set these up in a way that you can control who can see what data uh, according to their role in the organization. <clears throat> now, there are a variety of different methods that are used to enforce this data privacy. Uh, the, the most common one is access control, which is more of a binary allow or deny access to an asset. And this applies to both structured assets and unstructured assets. So for example, um, I may deny access to the vendor inventory table in this case because to, to the public access user group because it contains that part number. And in the context of uh, unstructured data, typically things like access control lists are used to enforce this data privacy. So in this case, since this assume that this design document is sitting on an NFS export, I can set an NFS v4 access control list or ACL to restrict access to this file for the, the public access group 
because it contains that part number. Um, this also applies to SMB protocol. And then for S3, there's bucket policies and ACLs for unstructured data. The other method that is used primarily in structured data at the moment is the, the notion of being able to redact or obfuscate or mask the data in a table. And by being able to do so, you can still show the column. For example, I can uh, redact or mask the vendor, the part number, and the stock. And so if, let's say, an end user is building an application and their application needs to have uh, access to the format of that information, they can do so, but they don't need to see the exact values. And so you can put in all Xs for the part number uh, or, and be able to retain the same data format so that they can still build their application without leaking personal, uh, you know, proprietary data or personal data. Great. Um, there's another question from the audience. And it looks like there's a lot of data access requests uh, from many, many users. And um, so the question is, how is this handled? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so that's a good question. So the first part is <clears throat> the, the policy engine, you set up these policies to be able to automate the enforcement of who can access what. And it's usually done at the group level. So if you um, add or remove users to a particular group, they inherit the, the group access permissions and the policy engine um, data privacy enforcement rules automatically. But uh, sometimes what you'll run into is that um, someone may in the organization may say, hey, I don't have access to this data, but I, but I do need to access it. So I need to go about requesting access to that. And so in that, in that case, Typically, there's a, a workflow and framework in the data governance layer of the data fabric that allows the users to be able to submit data access requests. And then the appropriate personas within the environment um, can automatically receive these data access requests and allow or deny access to that in, uh, through a, a more automated manner to be able to manage that versus uh, doing this on a one-off basis every time. Great. <clears throat> okay, so the next part of this looks at a customer example, uh, in particular for export control compliance. And the end objective is to provide uh, worldwide export control and compliance for over 30 billion files. So the data may reside in multiple different countries, and there are restrictions about uh, being able to export the data from one country to another. And the, the idea is that we need to be able to pr provide, uh, build first and foremost, a catalog of the 30 billion files that are out there. So uh, being able to do so is a challenging problem at scale. So you have to be able to attach to each of the data sources and harvest the information about all of the files in the environment and then you have to classify those files. Um, typically, when doing something at such large scale, if you the, the more you can classify the data without having to open each and every file to see what's in that data is much more efficient. So for example, if I have a particular NFS export and I know it belongs to a certain department that is sitting in uh, the US, I may label it uh, accordingly but sometimes you have to go into the data itself and look at what's in there in order to be able to determine the classification. So once you're able to uh, classify all of the data, uh, the 30 billion files, uh, now we need to enforce data protection rules. And again, those data protection rules are set based on the data governance or business terms that have been applied in the environment. And so in this case, what we've done is setting NFS before ACLs. So for example, if I have a, a data source that has information that's residing in the US, um, I, and then it's a, of a particular type that I've classified, I may not want to allow access of that data outside the US. So any group that tries to access that data outside the US is blocked from doing so via the data privacy policy engine and the group settings that we set up in the environment. And the other thing that we've done is 
again, we're extracting metadata about all of the unstructured data along with the structured data as well. And this metadata is much more lightweight uh, because in the, in the case of the unstructured data, we can have multiple petabytes of data, which is difficult to search for in a raw manner and to be able to dashboard in a raw manner. But by being able to take the metadata about all of that unstructured data and structured data and put it into this data fabric architecture, now we can quickly search on that, uh, find the data that we're looking for, again, for self-service data access, but also building an export control compliance dashboard. So being able to say that, um, let's say I have 30,000 NFS exports, I want to be able to have a dashboard that shows these exports reside in this country and they are protected by this data privacy rule with these access control lists set for these groups so that uh, I know I'm not leaking data to another country that shouldn't be able to see it. And so this dashboard can give you an end-to-end -end view of your data across um, all of these different data islands, regardless of the location where they reside. The last part of this <clears throat> is audit reporting. So uh, as, as there are more and more regulatory compliance uh, mandates coming out, there's a need to be able to prove that you're protecting your data adequately to avoid fines. And so in this case, being able to generate reports that shows how we, what data we have, how we've classified this data, uh, how we've set up data privacy rules to restrict access to this data and be able to report on this with file granularity um, is a, an important capability to have. And in this case, to, to go a step further, being able to show the access control list that are set on the file and how that maps to the different groups provides a, a very precise way of being able to do data fabric and this data governance and privacy across such a, a complex environment worldwide. So to wrap this up, um, what we're talking about is a, a data fabric approach to being able to provide uh, compliance, security, uh, self-service enablement of data residing in multiple different islands, regardless if they reside on-prem or in the cloud. And this data fabric is really an abstraction layer that is used across this hybrid cloud landscape. So it's, you can leave your data in place, you build this abstraction layer on top of your data, leveraging metadata or insights about your data that is collected uh, using a variety of different methods, incorporating AI into this to gain even more insights about your data. And once you have this view of your data uh, across both structured and unstructured data on-prem and in the cloud, now we can apply a common set of business vocabulary or data governance terms across this data. Again, this can be things like taking, for example, a, a social security number. We can say, I have a social security number sitting in this structured database table and social security number is sitting in this object storage bucket and in this um, file export as well. And by being able to do that, now I can have this, this view or a you know, dashboard view of where my, my sensitive data resides regardless of the location of it in this data fabric architecture. And then being able to then enforce these data privacy rules on top of this, uh, this abstraction ensures that you're not leaking personal data or sensitive data um, outside of the organization or to the inappropriate people and methods such as being able to allow or deny access to the data based on how that data is classified, being able to redact it, um, or mask it or obfuscate that data to preserve that data integrity format uh, helps to ensure trust, protection, uh, and, and security across the environment while also enabling self-service access for end users that need to leverage this data for a variety of um, goals such as building new applications or doing analytics or building business intelligence applications, et cetera. Awesome. Um, yeah, we, we have one more question. And um, what, uh, from a technical perspective, what are some of the next steps that you see to enhance this architecture? Um, so yeah, good question. So from a 
looking at the unstructured data side, there's there's so much unstructured data out there. And when you're talking about the size of that data with multiple petabytes of data, um, it's challenging to open up each and every file or object and classify that data, especially if it, that data is in different cloud locations, et cetera. And so the notion of computational storage is, is something moving forward, looking at being able to uh, classify and, and do things like natural language processing on the data to be able to understand if it contains customer names or what is in that data, but doing that uh, closer to the storage, leveraging techniques like computational storage um, offers you levels of efficiency uh, because now you don't have to pull that data across a network, for example. Um, you can eliminate a lot of the overhead, uh, offload a lot of that processing to uh, computational storage type of, of techniques to gain levels of efficiency in such a, a big type of problem set. Awesome. That's great. Um, yeah, I don't see any other questions from the audience. So uh, I want to thank you very much, Joe, for your expertise and insights. And this has been a fantastic discussion with lots of great information. And I really appreciate your time and effort to, uh, to work on this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great. And I also want to thank the audience. Uh, thanks for joining us. Please remember to rate this webinar as this is very important to get your feedback, which helps us create better educational material. And uh, also pre please remember, you can always download this presentation and many other items at our educational library, as well as follow us on Twitter. Uh, thank you very much and uh, please have a great day. Thanks again, bye-bye.